and welcome to Western Civ, episode 271, Galileo, part 3. Quote, when Galileo caused balls, the weights of which he had himself previously determined, to roll down an inclined plane, a light broke upon all the students of nature. They learned that reason has insight into only that which it produces after a plan of its own, and that it must not allow itself to be kept, as it were, in nature's leading strings, but must itself show the way. End quote. Immanuel Kant, Critique of Pure Reason, 1781. The question, of course, is, was Galileo an experimental scientist? To a large extent, I suppose that's been the question I've continuously posed throughout this series. Few subjects in the history of science are more contested, even today. There are a number of possible sources of confusion here. First, of course, what is an experiment? In modern usage, the idea of an experiment involves the reproduction of some naturally occurring phenomenon in a carefully controlled and therefore artificial setting. What Kant called reason proceeding, quote, after a plan of its own, end quote. We might distinguish between an experiment, which is designed to play a part within an argument, perhaps even to test a hypothesis, and an experience. An experience is different. I personally have experienced thunder a lot, but I don't have any idea how to create an experiment that would establish the cause of thunder. Now, the other part of this is observation, because observation tends to be the phrase that gets used the most, especially amongst early modern astronomers. Observation can be placed somewhere between experience and experiment. Having observed, for example, that I see lightning before I hear thunder, and having hypothesized that they both have the same cause, I would actually be a good step of the way toward devising an experiment that would make it possible to compare the speed of sound with the speed of light. Now, of course, in order to avoid unnecessary complications, this is a very loose determination of the word experiment, or at least the concept of experiment. Galileo had experiments, and I've called them experiments, but frankly, it would probably be more accurate oftentimes to speak of these as observations. For example, Galileo's trajectile experiment, you know, is really more of a observation. He probably just recognized that it formed a parabola based off what he was watching. He didn't attempt a series of controlled observations. He didn't study what would happen if he changed the speed dramatically of the projectile. In other words, he didn't really tinker with any of the variables. Now, the distinction between an observation and an experiment might be something that needs refinement even in our modern world. But everyone knows, I think, collectively what an observation is and generally how you do it. But such was not the case in Galileo's world. Cicero's Latin had no word for either experience or experiment. Experimentum enters Latin around the year 1600. But even Galileo rarely uses the term when writing. He, in fact, only uses the Latin for experiment twice. And only once does he use the term in Italian. Galileo, indeed, assumed that there were only two types of knowledge. Knowledge based on proof, like mechanics, and knowledge based on experience. He did, however, have a term for testing a hypothesis. In Latin, this is called periculum facere, which means literally to put to the test. This is not necessarily the same thing as our modern term hypothesis. It wasn't an open-ended test. Instead, the idea was more like having a range of possibilities you considered in advance, and then the experiment ticked off the boxes, yes or no. 
So really, it's very much a binary operation. It's either a zero or a one, depending on what happens. Thus, it's not clear yet if it should be too soon to say that Galileo was an experimental scientist. It may be, frankly, anachronistic at best. Certainly, he used experiments, or things that looked like experiments, but he was never an experimental scientist in our modern sense of the world. Not that that diminishes his value to the development of experimental science in any way. A classical example of our tendency to overestimate the value of our own knowledge is in a passage of The Two Sciences by Galileo. Here, he tells us to fill a glass container with wine and seal it with a stopper containing a very small hole. The hole needs to be so small that there will be no flow of wine out of the container if we hold it upside down. Now, place this container upside down in a basin of water. Slowly, very slowly, the wine will drift out of the bottom of the container and fall to the bottom of the basin, while the water will seed up into the container. Essentially, the water and the wine will switch spots. The great historian, André Coré, read this passage and thought it was ridiculous. Everyone knows that you can dilute wine with water, so he reasoned that in this case, you would both end up with a basin and a container full of diluted wine. Thus, he concluded that what he was reading in Galileo was actually a thought experiment. Galileo could never have tried it out in practice. Coré's conclusion is remarkable, as he could hardly have imagined that Galileo did not know that you could dilute wine with water. But no one actually repeated this experiment until 1973. And when they did, it turned out that Galileo was right, and Coré was wrong. So there's an important general conclusion here that we can draw from this. And that is, there's no way of testing whether Galileo was an experimental scientist, other than by trying to replicate the experiments he describes. It used to be thought that he had laid claim to a significant number of experiments that he had never actually conducted. Yet, there really appears to be, in, in all of his writings, only one example of his representing a guesstimate as if it were an actual experiment. Hence, in the end, even if Galileo did not follow all the tenets of experimental science as we call it today, there is no doubt, at least in my mind, that Galileo effectively invented the modern idea of experimental science, and the importance of that invention simply cannot be overstated. One of the most important pieces of evidence we have relating Galileo and experimental science is a letter from 1601, in which he details a classic experiment designed to prove the isochronicity of the pendulum. In order to understand this experiment, it's necessary for us to take a quick step backward. In On Motion, Galileo describes experiments involving bodies rolling down inclined slopes. He had also, in his textbooks on mechanics, compared the force required to pull an object up an inclined slope, a perfectly smooth object in this case over a perfectly smooth slope, with the force required to just lift it vertically straight up. It was easy to see that an inclined slope was simply a way of slowing down the acceleration of a falling object. It could be hypothesized that the speed at the bottom of the inclined slope, assuming no friction, would be the same as the speed that the object would reach if it had fallen from the same height, and that the time it would take to descend the slope would be in the same ratio to the time of the fall as the length of the slope to the height of the fall. If one could devise an exact enough way of measuring time, one could confirm this hypothesis by rolling balls down polished surfaces. Galileo, of course, didn't know that rolling balls behave slightly differently to sliding objects because they're rotating. At some point, Galileo carried out experiments to confirm this result, but he will have been confident of it long before he tested it. He knew the results could never be perfect. Of course, the ball would never be perfectly round, the slope never be perfectly polished. But all in all, the results were entirely satisfactory. Galileo then asked himself 
a follow-up question. Suppose an object takes one unit of time to fall an arm's length. Is there a formula for calculating the length and steepness of all the possible slopes that an object would slide down in the same unit of time? Clearly, the longer the slope, the steeper it had to be, until a slope of 89 degrees is going to be nearly an arm's length. The shorter the slope, the nearer it must approach the horizontal, until a slope of one degree will have almost no length at all. Galileo probably doodled around with lengths and slopes until he realized that if all the slopes ended at the same point, then all the starting points would form a curve. What sort of a curve? The simplest curve is a circle, and Galileo was soon able to demonstrate on the basis of his earlier hypothesis that if a circle were placed either vertically, then an object sliding down any part of it to the lowest point would take the same time as an object sliding down the other side. There was no need to test this. It was simply had to be true if the initial assumption was true, and any test of the initial assumption would confirm this. Essentially, what Galileo is doing here is constructing a science of falling bodies, which functions like mechanics. It was idealized, abstract, and of course, concluded only imaginary bodies. But it was of course deductively true, given an initial hypothesis and definition. But what about the pendulum? Surely all pendulums of the same length would take the same time to swing through different arcs, whether wide or narrow. Galileo could see that this should be true, but try as he might, he could not find a geometrical method of proving it. He had no mathematical procedure for handling a constantly changing angle of descent. Indeed, he was, bluntly, stuck. But this is when he stumbled upon a new author named Gilbert. And Gilbert was all about experiments. In fact, he had shown that you could prove theories through experiments. Could Galileo show through an experiment that all pendulums of the same length will swing through differing arcs at the same time? Could he prove this new law, in fact, if he couldn't, in theory? It is precisely this experiment that Galileo describes in the first of his letters after he read Gilbert. He wrote to a friend, in fact, describing pendulum experiments with which he claims he was able to demonstrate this law. Now, these experiments for historians have always been difficult because we know that Galileo's hypothesis is false. The length of the pendulum has to be made to alter very slightly as it swings, if every swing whether wide or narrow, is to take the same time. Galileo says that a pendulum swinging through a large arc and a pendulum swinging through a small arc will swing together, never getting the swing out of step. With the length of the pendulum, Galileo describes the differences of arc that he has in mind. Modern theory suggests that these two pendulums would be an entire swing out of step after only 30 or more swings. The conclusion, therefore, is simple. Either Galileo never actually conducted the experiment that he describes in these letters, or he simply made up the results. Or maybe there's a third option. The third option is that if you do perform this experiment incorrectly, you do get the result that Galileo describes. Because what happens is that Galileo was trying to allow for air resistance. And therefore, he changed the calculations in order to make it look like the pendulums had swung at the same time. In other words, what he's doing is he's account, trying to account, at least, for a variable, air resistance, without being able to do so. And to an extent, I suppose, falsified the results, although it was a falsification based on assumption that he certainly believed. What all of these experiments lead Galileo to is a final conclusion that gives an explanation of a path followed by a projectile. In other words, he's finally able to explain what he observed in 1592. And really what this is, 
is the culmination of hundreds of different experiments and observations that finally allow him to prove that a cannon would shoot furthest if it's set at an elevation of 45 degrees. And he could use his pendulum now to measure time more accurately than ever before. What he wanted to do, of course, was get these results into print. They would establish a new science. They would encourage others to adopt the experimental method. They would prove, finally, Galileo was a worthy successor to Archimedes. And they would show Copernicanism was 100% compatible with the laws of physics. In 1604, Galileo was 40 years old. He had served a long apprenticeship. He was beginning, at long last, to make some headway against his financial burdens. He was about to become famous. He began writing, in Latin of course, the book that he knew would have an impact far greater than anything else. The evidence suggests indeed by 1608, he had come really close to finishing this book, that we can find its text produced in Latin within its Italian dialogue on the two sciences. But one thing that's really interesting about all of this is that if Galileo was an experimental scientist, that is not how he wanted to present himself to the world. He wanted Europe to look on him as another Archimedes, the ultimate deductive scientist. The true role of experiment, in Galileo's mind, was not to explain. The true role of experiment was to establish facts that deductive reasoning could then explain. Galileo's experiments were preparatory procedures, undertaken in his quest for proofs. In fact, part of the reason Galileo fastidiously avoided using the term experiment was his desire to avoid being labeled an experimental scientist. It did not work. To one contemporary, Galileo was, quote, the founder of the experimental method in all its exactness, end quote. After his death, Galileo's students founded the Academia del Cimento, dedicated to the pursuit of scientific knowledge through experiment and experimentation. Frankly, had Galileo published his book on projectiles and falling bodies and done nothing else, he would have been a significant figure in the history of science, the founder of modern physics, the greatest physicist before Newton. In later years, Galileo's friends urged him repeatedly to publish, but he didn't do so until 1638. There's a 30-year delay that cries out for an explanation. I mean, Galileo had endless opportunities to publish. He could have published at any time after 1616. Banned from defending Copernicanism, this would have been the sensible thing to do. He even had a clean copy of a draft prepared in 1618 so that he could resume work. And for this delay, there's really only one explanation that works. And that is, in Galileo's mind, this project was inseparable from the much larger, and in his mind, more important one, the campaign to vindicate Copernicus. Prestige and fame weren't enough for Galileo. Proving Aristotle wrong wasn't enough for Galileo. Revolutionizing physics was not enough for Galileo. There was something else that mattered. But what exactly was that something? And this is, I think, really the question, because it defines what Galileo was all about. And in Galileo's view, the answer to this question is obvious. He wrote as follows, quote, The constitution of the universe, I, that is Galileo, believe, may be set in first place among all natural things that can be known. For coming before all others in grandeur by reason of its universal context, it must stand above them all in nobility as their rule and standard, end quote. No other thing stood above the universe in Galileo's mind. Everything depended upon it. And in his mind, Copernicus had it right. But how to prove it? <laughs> 
Well, the answer, it turns out, as we'll turn to now, is you have to change how you see. In autumn of 604, a new star appeared in the sky. News of it spread rapidly amongst those interested in astronomy. Thirty years earlier, in 1572, Tycho Brahe had turned a new star into quite the celebration throughout Europe. Now, of course, the problem is, is according to Aristotelian philosophers, the heavens were unchanging, eternal, perfect. There could be no change in the heavens, and any change that did take place had to occur in the vicinity of Earth. In their view, consequently, the choice was simple. Either that new star wasn't new at all, it had always been there, or it wasn't a star at all, but some peculiar phenomenon in the atmosphere. Since Tycho's new star soon disappeared, the argument was left unfinished, to be immediately reawakened by the appearance of this nova in 1604. As a Copernicus, Galileo, of course, knew where he stood. If Copernicus was right, the distinction between a sublunary and superlunary world was misconceived. There was no distinction between Earth and the heavens. The Earth was in the heavens and inseparable from them. If there was some change on Earth, then equally there could be change in the heavens. As someone who taught the military sciences, Galileo also knew how to measure distances. He knew it was not necessary to approach an object to work out how far away it was, so long as there was some other point of reference whose distance was known. By looking at an object from different positions, you could see how its relationship to other objects altered. Simple geometry could turn a measurement of a parallax into a calculation of distance. If the new star, when looked at from different places on the Earth's surface, had an unchanging relationship to the star around it, then it was very far away. Clearly, much further away than the moon. Galileo had soon collected the information to prove that the new star was indeed a star, that it was certainly not closer to the Earth than the moon. He gave a series of public lectures on the new star, attracting large audiences and provoking vigorous debate. Galileo must have considered publishing a version of his lectures on the Nova. Certainly, given the mood in Europe at the time, they would have sold well and would have constituted his first proper scientific publication. In the autumn of 1604, Galileo could show that the new star's location appeared to be the same when viewed from different European cities. The star then disappeared below the horizon of the night sky, to reappear in the spring of 1605. It was clearly Galileo's hope that when it reappeared, its relative position would have changed. If Copernicus was correct, he would now be looking at it from a point distance from his previous point of operation by the diameter of the Earth's orbit. Galileo must have waited with anxious anticipation for the star's reappearance. But... There was no change in its location. And while this was a disappointment, it wouldn't have been much of a surprise, given Galileo's understandings. Be that as it may, Galileo's letter made it clear. This was a star. This was something in the heavens. And it was new. And it turned out Galileo had some, I'll put it in air quotes, support. You see... In addition to Galileo's letter-slash-pamphlet, a second pamphlet appeared defending Galileo's interpretation of the new star. It was printed in Florence in 1606, and it was written by Alimberto Mari. But it was a ruse. Mari was Galileo. He had written under a pseudonym. Now, interestingly, in this pamphlet, Mari, that is Galileo, never explicitly discusses Copernicism, indicating maybe he knew he wasn't supposed to. But he does refer to Copernicus a few times, always with approval. So after just some heated arguments and good-natured mockery of the Aristotelian establishment, 
Galileo's first involvement in astronomy came to an end, and he turned his attention back to physics. Early in 1608, however, a Dutch spectacle maker discovered that if a convex lens was held behind a concave lens, you could enlarge the image. He mounted the lenses in a tube with a sliding mechanism, thereby making the first telescope. Soon, a number of different people were claiming to be the inventor, and word of the discovery spread rapidly. In May of 1609, Galileo claimed to have, quote-unquote, reinvented the telescope. What that really means in this instance is that he made a telescope without ever really seeing one, and without having been given an account of how one was constructed. He would later claim that reinventing was just as difficult as inventing. Archimedes, after all, had invented weapons of war that no one had been able to reinvent. Galileo would also claim that his knowledge of optics was crucial for being able to reinvent and improve the telescope. Galileo certainly had some knowledge of optics, but it is not clear that this played a significant role in either the reinvention or the improvement of the telescope. All that was involved was intelligent trial and error. In other words, experimentation. Galileo saw at once that the number of possible lens combinations was limited, and so all he had to do now was try them out. Galileo's first telescope, using lenses made for spectacles, magnified only three times. The best Dutch telescopes of the day magnified double that, about six times. The lens quality definitely was poor. There would have been a halo consisting of the colors of the rainbow around the edges of every object, and the image would have been blurred because the curvature of the lens was irregular. Its value, limited. Galileo's true genius, though, was that he grasped at once that the telescope could be improved. Now, today we live in a world where manufacturers are constantly offering us improved version of products. So if you or I had been shown a primitive telescope, we would have asked immediately how it could be improved. Galileo's world wasn't like this, though. Even new technologies, guns, printing presses, compasses, were improved slowly and over very long periods of time. By the summer of 1609, there were thousands of people, mathematicians, scientists, engineers, who had seen and used the new telescopes. But Galileo was the only person, the only one, who immediately saw the challenge. How could it be improved? Everything that he had done throughout his life had prepared Galileo for this moment. Galileo soon had a telescope that magnified eight times. He took this to Venice, where he displayed it to the city's rulers. It may have been the first telescope many of them had seen, though some will have known that others were offering to sell the secret of how to make one. Standing on the top of the bell tower in St. Mark's Square, they looked out to the sea and saw ships through Galileo's telescope that were invisible to the naked eye. The technology had obvious military potential. Galileo assured them that additionally, equally good telescopes could be made. Supported by powerful friends and associates, he pressed his claim for a reward, and it was agreed that he should receive an appointment at the university for life and a salary of a thousand ducats a year. In return, he agreed to spend the rest of his life in the service of the Venetian state. Now, impartial bystanders soon started muttering that Galileo had practiced nothing but deception. Telescope vendors were spreading out across Europe, carrying packs full of Dutch-made telescopes. Soon one could buy a telescope quite cheaply in St. Mark's Square, right where Galileo had demonstrated this new invention. Now this, of course, is the first ambiguity. And we don't know the answer to this, but had Galileo presented himself as the inventor of the telescope or merely as an improver of the telescope? And of course, that leads to another question. If Galileo's telescopes were better than the other telescopes that were now generally available, was there a secret to their construction, or could anyone who put in a little time and trouble produce an improved telescope? The Venetian establishment seems to have had its doubts. They couldn't go back on their word unless they were prepared to charge Galileo with a crime. 
but by the time the Venetian Senate came to vote on his reward, it seems clear they felt like they had been misled. Galileo's new appointment and his new salary was now only set to begin when his existing appointment came to an end, and the Senate decreed that his new salary was never to be increased. We can guess that Galileo was offended by this restriction, seeing it as an invitation to seek patronage elsewhere. The new salary was, after all, no better than one of his friends, who went on to double his salary in the years that followed, although he didn't receive an appointment for life. In 1609, both Galileo and the rulers of Venice were trying to make sense of this new technology. Galileo was certainly in a position to guess that others would soon be able to produce telescopes as good as his. But it's also the case that Galileo had kept a lead in the production, for the moment, of high-powered telescopes. By the autumn of 1609, he had a telescope that magnified 20 times. Four years later, by the beginning of 1613, one that magnified 30 times. And he was still well ahead of the competition. In fact, Galileo managed to stay ahead for 20 years. Galileo really did have something to offer Venice. But his telescope was not a new invention, nor was it made with any special techniques. I don't think that there was any deception here when dealing with the Venetian government. Rather, what the Venetian government failed to comprehend was that when they were buying this new technology, they were buying the man who was committed to improving it. But again, that just, that just wasn't the mindset of people in early modern Europe, so it's hard to fault them for it. Now, interestingly, this is just kind of an aside, but around the same time, we get some correspondence between Galileo and his younger brother. It seems that Galileo sent him a few telescopes so that he could give them to influential people and spread word of Galileo's discoveries. His brother sold the telescopes instead and kept the money. He wrote to Galileo a bit later, asking for more telescopes to sell. Galileo didn't send any. The whole affair is an interesting reminder of the reality that the great men and women in the past didn't live in a bubble. They had annoying familial relations, too. In Venice, in June and July, there's about 16 hours of daylight, and only eight in December and January. In the autumn of 1609, as the days shortened, Galileo turned his improved telescope toward the heavens. He mounted it on some sort of stand, but still, he had to learn how to slow his breathing. Even his pulse seemed to shake the telescope. And as the evening temperature dropped, the glasses kept misting up. In early January 1610, he discovered he could reduce the halo around objects by fitting a circle of masking material with an oval hole on the end of it over the lens. In photographic terms, he stopped the lens down. Still, the stars remained mere points in the heavens, except that there were many more of them now. He discovered that the Milky Way was not a mysterious white band in the sky, but a vast number of small stars, individually invisible to the naked eye. Elsewhere, there were new stars to be seen. It's easy for the significance of these new stars to escape a modern reader. It might be thought it hardly matters how many stars there are, but Galileo's contemporaries believed that the universe embodied a rational purpose. The sun, the moon, and the stars existed for one purpose and one purpose only, to give light to the earth. Invisible stars were a weird new concept. What purpose could a star serve if no one could see it? Only a few Copernicans had imagined a universe so large that there were distant stars invisible from Earth. As for the planets, through Galileo's telescope, they were not points but tiny disks floating in space. Naturally, Galileo turned his telescope to the moon, which was so greatly magnified that he could look at it at less than half the time, even with his 20-power telescope. Everyone knew that the moon wasn't perfectly uniform in appearance, but the philosophers still insisted that it had to be a perfect sphere, even if parts of its surface were more reflective than others. If the moon were smooth, the line between the illuminated half and unilluminated half 
should be perfectly regular. But Galileo, looking through his telescope, could see that the line wasn't regular. Moreover, near the margin between the illuminated and unilluminated half, he saw two anomalies. On the unilluminated side of the margin, he could see little flecks of light. The sun was clearly reaching some areas before it reached others. These must be high points. On the illuminated side, he could see dark spots, which the illumination took longer to reach. These must be shadows. Galileo's interest in painting and his experience looking at paintings where the tricks of light were used to convey textures and shapes probably helped him understand what he was seeing. But he also grasped at once that what he was seeing was comparable to a familiar phenomenon on Earth. At dusk and dawn, the sun stays on the mountaintops when the valleys below are deep in shadow. Galileo, therefore, had discovered that the moon had a landscape, a landscape of mountains and valleys. In this respect, it was just like the Earth. And this was corroboration of his view that the Earth seen from the moon would look just like an enormous moon. But there was so much more. On January the 7th, Galileo turned his telescope to Jupiter and noticed three stars arranged in a line with the planet, two to the east, one to the west. He had assumed that these were yet more fixed stars. But the next day, when he looked again, now all three stars were to the west of Jupiter, although Jupiter itself was moving from east to west. Somehow, two fixed stars had overtaken Jupiter. Galileo now began to observe Jupiter every night. By the 11th of January, he had decided that he was observing three satellites orbiting Jupiter. On the 13th, he discovered a fourth. Galileo now knew he had made a truly momentous discovery. By January the 30th, he was in Venice, arranging for the publication of a book on his telescopic discoveries. The Mountains on the Moon, The Nature of the Milky Way, the moons of Jupiter, all the while continuing his observations. Galileo was in a hurry. He knew other people had telescopes, and even if theirs weren't as good as his, it probably wouldn't be long until someone else had a telescope capable of looking at Jupiter's moons. And so Galileo, now aged 46, was writing a book. As he worked, he consistently tinkered with the title, suggesting he believed the book was designed to become a work of great importance. It was common when printing a book to print the body of the book first and then to add the prefatory matter. It's clear that this happened in the case of Galileo's observations. The large title on the first page to be printed was Astronomus Nunicus, which translates to the Astronomical Message or Astronomical Messenger. In his correspondence, Galileo referred to the book in Italian as Avisio Astronimico, or astronomical news, or maybe even starry news. But the final title, which was finished only as the last pages went to press on March the 12th, was Siderius Nuncus, or as we know the title today, The Starry Messenger, a messenger from the stars. The book proved to be a collection of observations, or more like a report than a narrative work. Galileo despised books about books. Prior to him, that was kind of all you really ever got out of scientists. Galileo went out of his way in writing his book to prove it was different. Indeed, after its publication, every other book on the stars became irrelevant, at least according to Galileo. Galileo doesn't offer facts in The Starry Messenger. He offers us observations. Some require no interpretation at all. Others, just a little deductive reasoning. Shadows on the moon become craters with a little thought, for example. Some of the illustrations of the moon within the book are amazingly accurate. They did have one significant flaw, however, which has puzzled later scholars. A singular feature. A crater which Galileo describes as being as large as Bohemia, 
that appears in large effects so big that critics have complained that if the illustrations were accurate, it would be visible to the naked eye. Now, the simple answer as to why this appears is that Galileo was persuaded that this singular feature was far larger and more noticeable than any other because he had already seen it with his naked eye. In the end, what's happening here in the Starry Messenger is Galileo is embellishing something because he believes so firmly that he is seeing it or has seen it with the naked eye. Did he? Probably not. But it doesn't change the fact that as a crater, it's large. Now, interestingly, after the Starry Messenger, Galileo did not include many illustrations in his books. And the reason is quite obvious. He expected readers to have or to obtain telescopes of their own. It was as though he was saying to all of Europe, the answers are there. Go and see for yourselves. But then on the 12th of February, Galileo received a letter from Belisario Vinta, the secretary to the Grand Duke of Florence. He reported that the Grand Duke was, quote unquote, stupefied by news of Galileo's discoveries. Galileo replied the very next day. Would the Grand Duke, who was called Cosimo, he had succeeded his father here before, like some of these new satellites to be named the cosmic stars after him? Or would he prefer them to be named the Medician stars, given that there were four of them and he had three brothers? Quickly, the answer came back. It was written on the 20th of February and would have reached Galileo a few days later. Cosmic, they wrote, was too ambiguous. It would not automatically make people think of Cosimo. Medician was better. Galileo made his arrangements for publication at the end of January. He had, in effect, book time on the press and could not wait for a reply. When Vinta's letter relaying the Grand Duke's choice arrived, the word Cosmica was replaced with Medicia. It would have been shortly after this that Galileo chose the final title for the book and wrote a prefatory letter in praise of Cosimo de' Medici. There's another more significant discovery to be made from examining the surviving manuscript. There are three passages in this book in which Galileo unequivocally declares his support for Copernicanism. Now, it's clear that when Galileo received Vinta's letter on the 12th of February, he had virtually completed a draft manuscript, which contained not a single reference to Copernicanism. The first and third sections of the book open with references to Venus and Mars orbiting the sun, but a knowledgeable contemporary would have been more likely to interpret this as a reference to Tycho Brahe, not Copernicus. In mid-February, therefore, Galileo made two bold and consequential decisions. He decided to put a reference to Sidera Cosmica in the title of his book and into its conclusion. And he decided to commit himself explicitly to a Copernican argument and to include within his book an implicit attack on Tycho Brahe. Galileo explains, then, that the phenomenon of Earth shine and shows that the Earth lights the moon just as the moon lights the Earth. As Galileo says, Earth shine is powerful evidence in favor of the Copernican claim that there's no difference between the Earth and the other heavenly bodies. Of the discoveries reported in the Starry Messenger, this is one of two which tell against the cosmology of Tycho Brahe. The implications of the other, the discovery that planets can have moons so that the Earth in principle could be a planet, were only put in the final pages. It's easy to see what changed, or at least what Galileo hoped was about to change. When Galileo entered into the contract with his printer, he was just an insignificant professor. But after the 12th of February, he became convinced that he was about to receive the support of the powerful Medici family, and therefore he was ready to come out in support of Copernicanism. It's worth pausing to see what Galileo was doing in mid-February. He was on the threshold of publishing a book that would stupefy the scholarly world. Success was assured. This was definitely going to sell. And so, he decided to raise the stakes and make his success uncertain. He committed himself to dedicating the book to Cosimo de' Medici before he even had permission to do so. Even more boldly, 
he decided to maximize the opposition to his book and minimize support for it by not making it simply anti-Ptolemaic, but explicitly Copernican. Of course, since he believed in Copernicanism, this had the advantage of allowing him to speak his mind. But it was a rash move to the extreme. Interestingly enough, if you look at the book, the rhetorical high point occurs in almost the exact middle. And it's remarkable in about three respects. It's transparently Copernican. It announces Galileo's great project, the system of the world. And it's only one of two places where Galileo ever uses the word experiment in Latin. Some of these passages lay out Galileo's thoughts on these new discoveries. And with these words, he both announces an imminent intellectual revolution and provides a sketch of his much larger work, Dialogue, which would not be published until 1632. Here's the relevant passage, quote, Let these few things said here about this matter suffice. We will say more in our system of the world, where with very many arguments and experiments, a very strong reflection of solar light from the earth is demonstrated to those who claim that the earth is to be excluded from the dance of the stars especially because she is devoid of motion and light. For we will demonstrate that she is movable and that she surpasses the moon in its brightness and that she is not the dump heap of filth and dregs of the universe. And we will confirm this with innumerable arguments from nature, end quote. The Starry Messenger was published on the 13th of March. Within a week, 550 copies were gone. Galileo, who was supposed to get 30 free copies of the book, received only six because it sold so quickly. There is no doubt that fame for Galileo had arrived at last. But at what cost? Mm-hmm.